wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how untraceable are his ways. The portion of his word that we consider today is taken from Jeremiah 33, verses 6 through 9. Behold, I will bring in health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return and will rebuild those places as at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Then it shall be to me a name of joy a praise and an honor before all nations of the earth, who shall hear all the good that I do to them. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I will provide for it. Here ends our text. In the name of Jesus Christ, the great physician of our souls, dear fellow redeemed, the pain of solar king, I can still feel it today, and it still makes me cringe. As a child, whenever I would get a scrape or a cut, my mother would pull out the solar cane, an antibacterial spray, and douse the exposed area. I hated it because it was more painful and it stung more than the actual cut. But my mother knew that I needed it to prevent infection. The solar cane may have stung when first applied, but then after a while, when the bandage was applied, it would feel a lot better. We all know that no cut is properly taken care of. If it's left exposed, it needs to be disinfected. It needs to be covered until it heals. Regardless of what injury you have, those two steps to, are necessary for a vital recovery. First, you must cleanse that injured area. You must get rid of the bad things, the infection, and then you must protect it. The Holy Spirit brings a similar picture to us today in our text. To the prophet Jeremiah, he describes the wonderful healing that the nations of Israel and Judah would receive. But Jeremiah also prophesies of a greater deliverance from spiritual captivity, from a much greater enemy, from bondage under sin. We ask the Holy Spirit to bless us as we meditate on how the Lord has healed us by cleansing us of our sin and protecting us with his forgiveness. When you look at the life of Jeremiah, he had quite a difficult task. And if we could sum it all up into one statement, the task of Jeremiah was to speak the truth. Now, Jeremiah didn't have a problem coming up with the content of what to speak. The Lord told him exactly what he wanted him to tell Israel and Judah. The problem was that they didn't want to listen. That's the thing about the truth when it comes to not only the lives of Israel and Judah or Jeremiah, but even in our lives, we only want to listen to it if it contains something good for us. If the truth tells us something that we don't like to hear or something that's undesirable to us, then we often deny it and we don't want it in our lives. Now we must admit that our text and the words before us today don't sound all that bad. In fact, the language used to describe the Lord's deliverance is very beautiful. Without a doubt, no one had a problem when Jeremiah said these words to him. No one disregarded the Lord's message of deliverance. But if we back up a couple verses, we see the side of God's truth that they didn't want to hear. In verses 4 and 5 of Jeremiah 33, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah that were torn down to make defense against the siege mounds and against the sword. They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans and to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I shall strike down in my anger and my wrath. For I have hidden my face from this city because of their evil. What a dire picture Jeremiah gives just a couple verses before our text. He talks about the situation being so bad for Israel and Judah that they would have to tear down their very homes as a defense against the enemy. And not only that, those homes, that rubbish, would be filled with dead bodies of soldiers. How could such two contrasting scenes be so closely connected in the text? Well, the simple answer is that it was the truth. And this truth was a recurring theme in the history of Old Testament Israel. 
Jeremiah, like many of the Old Testament books, is riddled with examples of Israel's falling from the Lord in idolatry and unbelief, and then the Lord bringing them back again and teaching them and restoring them. The Old Testament lists a long list of Israel's self-inflicted wounds that they didn't take care of, that they allowed to fester and grow an infection through unbelief. But with every account of Israel's failings, an even stronger example of the Lord's deliverance and protection shines forth, just as we see today. But what good would the Lord's faithfulness be? What good would His protection be if Israel would continue in their evil ways? How could they stay healthy if the Lord would not cleanse what was going wrong in their life? Remember what we said at the beginning, with every proper healing comes the two necessary steps. You must cleanse out that which is bad, and you must protect so that it can heal. Judah would soon realize that the correction of the Lord was not an easy process to go through, was not always pleasant to the sinful flesh, but was absolutely necessary. In less than a year after Jeremiah wrote these words, that cleansing process would begin as the Babylonians swept down into Israel and Judah and carried them off into captivity for 70 years. Seven years may seem like a long time. It's actually longer than a generation of people for the nation of Israel. But that captivity, that oppression, that cleansing process would not last forever. Judah would again return to their homeland. Jerusalem would again become a thriving and prosperous city through the Lord's deliverance. But as Jeremiah writes these words, he's focusing on much more than just physical deliverance from a physical nation. He's focusing on much more than just the lives of Israel and Judah. Jeremiah is focusing most of all on the Lord's promise of deliverance, on the Lord's promise to send that one Savior to cleanse us from our sin and heal us through the gospel. Jeremiah called him the branch of righteousness, and we know him as Jesus Christ. A couple of chapters before the events of our text, Jeremiah recorded the Lord's promise about this coming Savior, a message that applied to all people, not just to Israel. The Lord said to Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This promise would be different than the first promise of the Lord that he previously made with Israel because it would be built on the gospel. It would be built on what Christ would do for us, not what we do for God. The promise of God recorded by Jeremiah was applying to all people and was built on the forgiveness of our sins. And that promise finds its fulfillment in Jesus. We see that fulfillment from the book of Hebrews in chapter 9 where the writer says, How much more... Will the blood of Christ and the blood of animal sacrifices, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called by him may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Jesus Christ is the one mediator of the new covenant. He is the fulfillment of the very promise that Jeremiah gave because he was the only one to perfectly offer himself up. All of those previous animal sacrifices pointed to Jesus, but they failed in one way or another. They were not good enough to pay for our sins or the sins of the entire world. Only Christ, who offered himself for our sins, could make that fully and satisfactory payment. But just like Judah and Israel in Jeremiah's day, we too need to be daily reminded to be cleansed from our sin and receive this message of salvation. A helpful illustration that I like to think of is the job of an auto body specialist. When you think of what an auto body specialist does, if they're a real professional, they don't just paint over a dent or a scratch or a patch of rust on a car. No one would be satisfied with that type of work. No one would call that professional. No one would say that that job was done completely. Because although the dent or the scratch or the rust may look good right when you paint over it, it may be uh, oblivious to our understanding before it it resurfaces itself, it's eventually going to come back at some point. Only after that that scratch is buffed out or that dent is 
is banged out or that rust is grinded away, can you go back and restore and paint over and complete? The same applies to our spiritual lives. The Lord doesn't simply paint over our ailments. He doesn't overlook our sins without doing anything about them. The Lord works hard to clear out the problem of our sin and to cleanse us and heal us. The Apostle Paul used the illustration of leaven when he explained it to the Corinthians. He writes, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Let us keep the feast not with the leavened bread of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Instead of allowing sin to spread through our lives like leaven or like rust, God cleanses it out. But sometimes that cleansing process isn't very pleasant for us. Sometimes it's not really what we want. Sometimes we want to be content in our sins. We want to hang on to them. And we don't want to face the harsh reality of the truth that they're affecting us. Oftentimes the solution isn't quick or easy. In fact, our sinful flesh would much rather have God paint over our ailments and forget about them in the present time and not worry about the future. How quick we complain in our lives when things get difficult, when God sends us something that we don't like. Instead of appreciating all the blessings that He gives us and understanding that adversity comes because of our sin, we get angry, we get bitter, we get vengeful at God because we don't like the adversity and the tests that He sends us. So often we take that same attitude that Judah did with the message of Jeremiah. We have no problem accepting the blessings and the good things that the Lord gives us, but when He tests our faith, when He gives us a moment of adversity to make us stronger, we start to complain. That is because by nature, because of the sin that we have, we don't want anything to do with the Lord's cleansing process. We want to remain as we are. We see an example in the Bible that applies to our lives when you look at the life of Job. Just after Satan struck Job with painful boils, his wife breaks down and tells Job to curse God and die. But notice how Job responds to her. He says, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? Job understood the foolishness of hanging on to the spiritual infection. Job understood the truth that God needs to cleanse that sin away. And sometimes that comes through a test. Sometimes that comes through God teaching us something through adversity to help us understand His wisdom. Before his affliction, Job and his family had tremendous wealth. Do you think Job's wife ever complained about that? Do you think she ever said that God was unfair because they had more wealth than others and they had abundant blessings? Certainly not. But the single moment of adversity, at one example of a painful experience, she wants to curse God and die. Likewise, we ourselves, in stubbornness and ignorance, so often rejoice in the blessings of the Lord but complain and get angry at the tests that would strengthen our faith, at the tests that would show us the futileness of our sin and the infection that it wraps our hearts through our sinful nature. More often, we want to stay connected to those pet sins that make us feel comfortable rather than painfully stripping them away through that cleansing process. So often in our lives, Jesus is cleansing our hearts without us even knowing about it through a simple conversation with somebody or through a painful experience that we may go through during the week, Jesus is teaching us something through that. Jesus is reminding us to look back to His Word for our comfort and our strength. Jesus is reminding us not to hang on to that sin because it's harmful for our lives. And if left unchecked, it can destroy our faith. So often Jesus is doing that day by day in every other little moments of our lives, but we often don't think about it. Think about moments more specifically in your life. How often have you fallen into a sin that uh, you actually convinced yourself that it's not that bad? Usually it starts off with something very innocent sounding, something like a white lie or something like telling something about gossiping somebody or a hurtful joke, something that really seems innocent on the surface. 
And we do things in our minds to rationalize and to convince ourselves that it's really not that bad, and it's really not bad in God's eyes, and he really isn't going to take us under condemnation for it. He's not going to punish us for it. Everybody else is doing it. We can think of a multitude of excuses to offer up for things that we try to reason out in our heart. And before you know it, we grow comfortable with the scrapes and the cuts that life brings us. We get content with the infection that starts to grow on our hearts. And before you know it, we're increasing our spiritual infection all the more, and eventually it's threatening our faith. But who better to have in your corner in these moments than the one who knows exactly what you go through, the one who experienced the threat of temptation, the feelings of sorrow and pain that you go through on a daily basis, the one who knows how life can try to beat you down into submission, the one who experienced the pain of your sin and had no bandage to heal him. Jesus is the one who can lead you safely through the cuts and scrapes of life without having to become infected by unbelief. As painful as his cleansing may be at times to our sinful flesh, you can rest assured that it affects just that, your sinful flesh. The painful cleansing is not going to harm anything that's worth it in your life. God has blessed us with his word that we may see for ourselves exactly what Jesus went through on our behalf, how he willingly stepped into our place, how he walked in our shoes, how he fulfilled the law in our place, how he showed kindness and love to his neighbor when we don't, how he suffered the bitter pain of the cross, the very agony and torment of being forsaken by God because of our sins. The Bible tells us and shows us so that we can see that for our own eyes, so that we can see that Jesus is one that can give us cleansing and healing. Jesus can back up his promises when he tells us, like he did through Jeremiah, that he's going to start a new covenant with us, a new promise that's not built on what we do, but it's built on the forgiveness of our sins. When you're discouraged over the pain of your sins, don't ignore the problem just because you don't want to think about it. Don't push it off for the future. Don't put it on somebody else. Look at the truth. Take responsibility for your sins. Confess them before God and meditate instead upon the pain that your Savior endured for you. Because through that pain, you are healed. Hold fast to the important lesson of our text for today, the lesson that Jeremiah taught Israel and Judah. Be on the guard against sin and be aware how before you know it, and without you even realizing it, it can take hold of your heart. May the Lord grant all of us patience and wisdom that we don't react foolishly when we're confronted with our sins, that we don't lash out in anger and bitterness toward God when He cleanses those sins out of our lives, but that we understand with humility and wisdom the Lord's plan for us. When you get down to it, the idea of a bandage is really a good picture of a mediator, just like Hebrews tells us that Christ is. A mediator or a substitute or a go-between. A bandage is there in place of your skin. It's even designed to look like your skin, to be colored like your skin. It's designed to function like your skin, to cover up your, your body so that it may heal without being infected. In the same way, Jesus alone and the works that he has done are the bandage for our spiritual ailments. He is our perfect substitute. He is our go-between that steps into our place when we get cuts and scrapes because we're sinful. And He heals us so that we're found worthy before God. He came and did what we could not do spiritually, what our skin spiritually could not do to protect us. He came like one of us to protect us from all evil, from all infection of Satan, from the world and our sinful flesh. And on top of that all, He offers you not only protection from things that are evil, but the blessings to move forward in God's grace, the blessings to look forward with anticipation for your future because your sins are forgiven, because you have an eternal inheritance before God. Jesus gives you a healing that stands the test of any injury and a healing that stays with you for eternity. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.